Hello and welcome to Downstream, the Navarra Media interview series where we pick through all the flotsam and jetsam of politics and culture with an esteemed and insightful guest. And with me this week is Moya Lothian McLean, political editor of Gaudem and author of one of my favorite opinion pieces recently, Keir Starmer is a wet wipe. <laughs> Uh, Moya, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I feel like that that op-ed will haunt me for the rest of my dying days. I mean, days. not as much as it's going to haunt Keir Starmer. What was it like <laughs> when you got that kind of official rebuttal from a Labour spokesperson? Were you expecting it? I wasn't. No, I wasn't expecting it at all. I was expecting about uh, 50 people on the left Twitter to read it. And when I got the rebuttal, I just thought, what a sad man. <laughs> It's like, you should not man. be reading my article. You shouldn't have this time. I was like, this is great for me, but terrible for you. And the <laughs> fact that you don't even have like the political new to realise that signposting this article will bring so much more readers to it than would have done otherwise just bodes so ill that that you have to write that you'd rise to that. So you know, uh, it was. It, I did think, what a sad man. I it was great an for interesting me, miscalculation. Um, but we're not actually here to talk about the leader of the opposition and whether or not he'd be better off, you know, actually opposing the government yeah. every once in a while. Um, because as well as being a very incisive political commentator, Moya's astute and sometimes acerbic observations of pop culture are why you'll often find me just like lurking around her Twitter account. Sort of like nodding alone in a room by myself and like offering that's, a sly like here and there, but not wanting to look too desperate. That's very nice. That's also how I read my own tweets. So I have that in common. <laughs> just going, <laughs> this girl's great. <laughs> Tweeting from your alt account. Like for my alt account. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I just I would like to confirm I've never liked any of my tweets from my old account, which may or may not exist. <laughs> I mean, this wasn't a, a trial for like, have you been like self boosting? But I don't know, <laughs> bit too defensive, if anything. Yeah, she doth protest too much. No, <laughs> have that on record. I didn't do it. <laughs> that you can prove. Um, so you've been writing a bit recently about the first pop cultural development that made me feel like I was old and losing touch, which is the rise the rise of the influencer industrial complex. Because I felt like I had a grasp on who was famous and who wasn't. Right up until that whole Caroline Calloway is a scammer thing popped up. And I realized that I was watching the fall of somebody who I'd never known to rise in the first place. I felt like I'd caught the third act of a drama and had no idea the first two were going on. So the Caroline Calloway thing was blowing up and I was just thinking, fuck, who is this person? And why have they got like a six figure book deal from writing out the captions from their Instagram? And it made me think that maybe we should take social media influencers a lot more seriously, not just because they've now become such a huge part of our pop culture, but because it's blurred the line between activist and online personality between amateur and professional poster. And all of these things have got implications for how people become politicized and what they think the terrain of politics is. So my first question for you, super simple, super big, is what is an influencer? Oh, oh, I mean, if the influencer marketing industry knew what an influencer was exactly, then they'd have had it pegged down a bit more than this. There are definitions that exist. Um, on the Competition and Markets Authority and the Advertising Standards Agency, mainly because they needed to know who they had to regulate. Um, and I can't cite that definition from memory, but uh, influence is basically somebody, nowadays they're considered someone who has taken money from a brand and uses their influence to promote that brand. Of course, this doesn't actually cover the sort of wide range of influences as we know them, because influences come in so many different forms. You've got your like basic content creators who are your beauty vloggers, you know, um, your, I don't know, lifestyle vloggers, lifestyle bloggers, the people who their sort of main raison d'etre is, you know, they are human meet the Joneses. They are people who make money from promoting products and they make content specifically for that. And that is how they've risen to fame. They're very good at it. They don't like being called influencers anymore because influencer <laughs> has taken on a slightly different um, meaning. Um, so your con yeah, your content creators are sort of a separate lane. Your content creators are the likes of Mrs. Hinch, uh, Zoella, um, Mel's wardrobe, you know, people who make different types of content to be consumed specifically for selling products and 
you know, within that lane, they operate under a different set of rules. So that whereas your influencers, this is also a very broad category, but your influencers tend to now mean just anyone sort of with a large platform, whether they're influential or not is a different matter, but somebody with a large platform on social media. So, you know, you could become an influencer. You're someone who also, I would say, primarily communicates through social media. Your platform is on there. You can have people who go from reality TV to social media, but what, it's your main sphere of influence is online. So that's why you have people like, um, let's say, more Higgins or who come from reality TV and then their continued sphere of influence is online. You know, they might do the odd TV project, but their main way they're communicating with followers, the main way they're getting money, the main way they're promoting things and the main way they're building a brand is online through that influence um so there's a there's a lot of it's interesting because you have like a lot of z-list celebrities have now turned into what we call influencers because they've realized it's more um financially beneficial to do that um but influencers don't solely exist to make money per se well actually that's a hard one they often end up making money whether they intend to or not and then they become a different type of influencer but influencers can come overnight because anybody who sort of blows up online and gets a platform is now seen as influencers. So sometimes you get dragged into it without even wanting to. There are probably people out there who'd call you an influencer. I don't make enough money like, to be an influencer, and man. You're like, I don't I've make got, an influencer. I've but- got all of the psychological damage <laughs> from posting too much and none of the financial security. <laughs> I don't know if I, but it's, it's that thing. It's like anybody who's seen as having a large platform and a large sort of command, command, command a large following online is now seen as an influencer, which is why it's very hard to sort of narrow down and define specifically what it is. But I would say broadly, it's somebody that can monetize their online following and has what we'd call a sphere of influence, whether that is positive or negative through those online platforms. I mean, so for people that aren't familiar, what does an influencer get paid for? Because we've all seen the posts on Instagram, which are captioned with ad and it's like uh, tooth whitening stuff or I don't know, essential oils. And it's pretty obvious, like you are being paid to promote this product. And then there's a kind of more nebulous self-branding where they become a face not just of a specific product but a kind of lifestyle and they end up being paid to be themselves in some way um so what what kind of you know financial uh transactions are they a part of well, this can range because also a lot of financial transactions that influencers are part of um, may not be tracked or even declared despite advertising rules. So, and it can really it can really go from anything. You know, you can have your, as you say, bog standard, simple brand deals where you are paid to advertise a product. You can have your gifted um, sort of products, which is where you don't have to um, declare that you know you've been paid you don't have to post that if you do post something say say if I got sent um, a laptop from Google Google if you're listening um, I'd love a laptop they always are <laughs> they are always listening <laughs> I know this from my Instagram ads um, yeah if you got sent a laptop by Google and they said oh we just want to send you a laptop if you post that on Instagram you just have to write gifted because they haven't said you have to post that but it comes with the unspoken agreement that you probably will um, because it's a brand association um, for example someone you know if you have something from the likes of Boohoo or Misguided those clothing companies they send out tons of clothing to influencers influencers may not post some of that because it might not be what they want for their brands but if they do they have to tag it gifted whereas if you do a paid partnership which is you enter a contract with a brand to post a certain amount of content or make videos um you know just big them up on your socials post a certain amount of tweets with this caption that is um, a sponsorship and so it's a paid promotional campaign so then you have to um, tag those posts ad on on Instagram there's a new feature where you can tag it paid promotion Um, and then you can have sort of just like brand ambassador deals where you know that would still be an ad and it'll still be a paid partnership so that it's slightly different from a sponsorship it's a partnership thing but that's when you have a long-running relationship with a brand and you'd promote their content in different ways or you could simply sort of go about your life using them so you'd integrate it as like a partner there was a really interesting video on I think went Twitter the other day but it was from TikTok originally and it's of a I think a 
a cooking influence they must be. I'd never seen them before, but it's this woman and she's making quesadillas and she's a bounty, as in the bounty kitchen roll partner. Mm. And she all she does in that video at one point is use bounty to put her fried quesadilla on and get the grease off. And that's how she's in. She's a long term bounty partner. She's like, look how well it soaks up the grease. And then she goes on with making her cooking video. And that's how you integrate that sort of sponsorship mm. within like a daily life thing, which is what the top level influencers do. They know how to. But with the sort of influencers that we're talking about, which is less the professional content creators and more, I think, the people who've come from sort of like um, vlogging about what is termed activism by lots of media brands or perhaps um you know the reality tv stars who come from love island the brand deals tend to be a lot more shameless a lot less integrated and sort of like look at this new toothpaste i'm using and it's quite clear they've never that toothpaste has not been within a mile of their teeth they're just (laughs) they're just well apart from when they hold it up in the video oh they're like here's my here's my hair vitamins that have made my hair go really long as they wear a wig um (laughs) So it's it's that kind of thing. So that you know that this this people it's not that people object to this paid content. I think it's that when it's done clumsily, people don't like to be seen that they're marketed to. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the range of main um, financial deals influencers can strike with brands. I mean, because I want to talk about how influencers are this new era in the development of celebrity Mm. because of course celebrity culture has changed a lot over the centuries um you had celebrity culture sort of being contained around aristocratic circles and those who entertain them then had the sort of development of you know radio and movie stars television um you know sports stars started becoming you know more and more famous in their own right you had the huge branding deal you know secured by Michael Jordan which like set the tone for everyone else that followed and then you had the advent of reality tv where people were like hey you're famous just for being famous and then influencers seem to be a kind of extension in some ways of the world of reality tv because even though there is a heightened artifice to the whole thing because I refuse to believe that anyone wears false fucking eyelashes in bed <laughs> as they're like eating they you know when you see like you know Lucy mm. from Love Island like posing in bed with like an array of carbs that she's never even seen before you know and I'm just like bullshit mm. um you know it is artificial but there is an you know a kind of performance of daily life that Mm. you get to see. And that's very different from, you know, the kind of branding and stuff that, you know, Michael Jordan did, you know, when partnering with Nike or um, who was the supermodel who partnered with Pepsi and it was like the massive deal. Was it Christy Turlington? Oh, you're talking way back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I'm talking about like, you know, baby's first influencers. That might be But a different thing. (laughs) My memory. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but what an influencer does implicitly it says well this is my everyday life come and look at it and be a part of it Mm. um do you think that it creates weird expectations then amongst the audience and the followers of those people I mean, there's, there's several strands there that are important to touch upon. First of all, of course, influencers are the extension of reality TV culture. That was they are they are the sort of like natural end game of the sort of panopticon of surveillance that went on with reality TV stars. You know, we wanted 24 seven access. And once the Internet was on, we got it. Um, it's like with the Love Islanders, when the Love Island journey ends, when that 24 hour surveillance ends, we still have access to them all the time on their platforms. And that is the expected thing to do. That's how they build a brand. It's that continued access. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 also the interest. It's interesting how. We could say it's diluted celebrity in some ways because, you know, it's that 15 minutes of fame. Everyone is, can be an influencer now. You even have micro-influencers, nano-influencers, mm. which is just the term for somebody whose friends and family follow them. But now that's you're, now you're seeing your terms of your sort of influence. So it's rather than saying like, oh, these are people you engage with. It's how many people can you influence? What is your sphere of influence? Um, and it's this very, it's like classic late stage capitalism, you know, like thinking in those terms of how can you monetize these relationships? How, and it's also how much value do you have based on how much influence do you have? Um, so those celebrity relationships, yeah, of course, you, you have to think of that as this aspect but it's also like yeah this aspirational capitalism that we're being sold 24 7 on one level of course we all know that it's artificial that's also why we buy into it a bit it's like molly may haig who was a before she went on love island she was a content creator which is also why i think she's been so good at it when she came off people really like people really took to her last year um even people of color 
So there was she had a big following amongst quite like a large population of young black people and young South Asian people who really just enjoyed the luxury content she was Mm. creating because it is that escapism it is that fantasy and it is that selling of like this is this could be your life it's not going to be but it could be if you buy some of these things and we do you know we do like retail therapy capitalism has done that number on us we do we do buy into that otherwise you know fast fashion wouldn't be as big as it is the internet internet shopping wouldn't be as big as it is we have so much convenience now and access and influence is sort of like this gateway that just say come on into this wonderful paradise um where if you just buy this top it's it's wonderful you know it's great um you'll be happy and yeah i've fallen victim to that several times <laughs> but it's following them is also i mean it is damaging to your psyche and your bank balance because whether you think you are above it or not that sort of constant perfection and that illusion of perfection will will get to you will impact you and you might think it's not but then you catch yourself looking in the mirror and like thinking like why am I not this shape or why why when that person wore those jeans do they look slightly different why does their skin always look completely smooth and perfect why is their like eye shape so symmetrical compared to mm. mine it's because you know you whether you, you think you might be above it and you think you might have to spot the tricks but our brain is actually just taking those images in and seeing them as truth I mean I think you said something really interesting mm. about this being you know kind of textbook late stage capitalism and I think that there are two aspects of that that I kind of want to pick up on mm. one is the commodification of every sphere of your life so all of those things which were non-commercial So those bits of your daily life, cooking, getting ready to go out, those things which don't actively involve a financial transaction have themselves become monetized and then have set an expectation for other people who don't monetize those aspects of their lives, you know, buy these products and then your version of this could look like my version of this, whereas it's their job for it to look like this and it's not your job. And then the other is the kind of huge intergenerational wealth inequality where people of our generation do not have access to assets, to capital. Um, The things which were cheap in our parents' generation are prohibitively expensive, you know, like a home. But the things which were prohibitively expensive for our parents' generation and before, like fashionable clothing, like makeup, like stuff to do your hair, prices of those things have collapsed mostly because the production costs have been undercut um via workers wages so boohoo and pretty little thing and you know all the other kind of sweatshoppy fast fashion brands there's a reason why that skirt costs four pounds um and the way in which influencers have kind of inserted themselves like at that intersection of an indebted audience a financially immiserated audience who also have become accustomed to quite a high standard of living yeah I mean I think it says it all that some of the conversations on Twitter recently have been solely about you know whether it's it's good to be able to access Birkin bags how many of us are buying Birkin bags you know we're not, we're not going to touch this but there is this real illusion because of influencing that I think is as you say, it's at, it's at that odds with um, this idea that, you know, we're a generation who were used to like this small scale luxury and we're used to being able to access small, these little small luxuries like, you know, new clothing, whatever we want, a new, new smelly candle, like the trappings, the aesthetics of luxury without actually having the assets to back it up and the lifestyle. Um, and it, 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 it says a lot that like we somehow, well, I would say I'm speaking for all of us. I think a lot of us somehow have been, mentally sort of lulled into the idea that we're on a par with these influencers and that you know their lives are relatable in that way and it's like you you know they're not and and that also we could reach them and they are aspirational but they're not aspirational because you can't aspire to something out of reach like just financially obstructed um so all it does is sell us more and more and more of these small scale luxuries as we try and sort of make up for the fact we don't have access to these big ones um and then that that piles up and you know the more you're spending on fast fashion the less you're gonna have to save for a house not to sound like a telegraph columnist but um (laughs) because i'm not trying to buy a house anytime soon but you know it's true um so i think i think that's definitely like one aspect of it where it's like we have this real disconnect and it's almost an escape from the reality of our situation you know like 
I think that's something our generation lives in, in that we, on the one hand, we're so brutally aware that, you know, a lot of us can't afford this house. A lot of us can't afford cars. A lot of us can't afford to live in a capitalist world because we simply don't have the financial um, assets or whatever to do that. But it's, it's a distraction from that. And almost the influence of the world is like that hypodermic needle, that shiny illusion that, no, 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 it's fine. You're still, it's still working perfectly. You're still, you know, lull, go to sleep and just buy this and it'll all be okay. And when you wake up, maybe the money will have appeared. Um, I think I think it's definitely sort of like our escape. Mm. It makes us think that things are completely normal and things are working and normal, especially when you see young people who've been elevated to that point of um, having the financial capital assets who, through appearing on a TV show or posting lots of photographs of themselves online. It's like, oh, maybe I could do that too. Um, so there's there's definitely that element. And could you just refer to the point you made first? Because I've completely forgotten what it was. Uh, the point I made first was also about the kind of com- the commodification mm. of yeah. every single aspect of your life, yeah. um, every single interaction, every single thing you do in your day. Yeah, I mean, that is sort of, again, capitalism on crack and that is turning any sort of labour and leisure into something we can monetize. And But are we seeing the financial benefits of that in the end? No, because all we're doing is buying to make that happen. So we think that, you know, putting everything online or seeing that, seeing everything as an opportunity to monetize and, monetize and commodify will make us rich. But in fact, you have to buy to get to that stage in the first place because people aren't going to watch your video about, um, I don't know, getting ready or cleaning unless you have bought a new product or you have a new thing to talk about in that. So, you know, Mrs. Hinch went viral because she was always talking about this new product and this, you know, these new cleaning methods. And this is, and yeah, they're like budget cleaning things, but you always have to buy, buy, buy mm. to buy into that. There was a selling without her maybe even realising she was selling because she was constantly talking about these new methods, new products, et cetera, that she was using. So, um, yeah, it's, it's that it's that idea that we think that, oh, we could monetize this if only I buy this to make it more interesting. You know, I'm going to make a front facing video about this. And I've, I've done this before. You know, if I find a product that I like for my eczema, for example, mm. I'm like, I have to share this with everyone. And I'm inadvertently doing Superdrug's job for them by telling mm. everyone how great vitamin E cream it was, it, which it is. But it's like, why am I making a front facing video? Why have I learned to speak in the rhetoric of an influencer without being an influencer? Because that's how you pick it up. You learn to speak in their language and their language is just a language of commodification. I mean, it's also interesting to me that there's this whole gender aspect to it as well. So when we use the word influencer, we tend to be referring mm. to women, occasionally gay men as well. But within those spheres of activity which have traditionally been considered female so cooking cleaning makeup fashion um there's of course fitness influencers too but there's a difference in Mm. emphasis a male fitness influencer versus a, a female fitness influencer why is it that with PewDiePie, for example, or Hassan Piker, we don't call them influencers. We call them PewDiePie, live streamers, YouTubers, and we define um, them by their technological platform. Yeah, I mean, it's straight up sexism and sort of like um, any femme misogyny. Um, it's it's quite it's quite it's quite a basic answer. It's it is because at the end of the day, I think we, for whatever for whatever reason, I mean, misogyny is the reason, but we see women as selling as more craven um more inauthentic um it's coming from it's seen as coming from a place of individual gain whereas it's not like the men are doing anything different in that sense but there's seen there's some somehow a more, more of a morality is attached to that so i think one of the reasons as well influences we've been sitting here talking about influences and why we're so fascinated by it as this sort of very shallow culture is because there is a gendered aspect to it and you know I can't say that I'm, I've escaped that. Like, why do I like to sit and critique influencers? Probably there is a bit of latent misogyny in that. Like, why should I not just let the women and the gays get their bag, you know? But also because it's the height, it's the height of capitalism and like poisonous capitalism. But maybe what I should be doing instead is broadening who I talk about when I speak about influencers, because you do have these like, but that, Actually, that's also interesting because it's like the inf- category of influence is so broad in the first place. It's very hard to pin down. So when I talk about someone like um, Lucy Donlan from Love mm. Island, you know, I'm speaking about a very in a very specific, disdainful way about the way she sells things and the way I see her, which is probably laden with a bit of misogyny. Yeah. And when I speak about PewDiePie, I, I speak more about how this person is someone I see as a bit of a danger because of the views that he's helped promote. But 
there's definitely less misogyny in there. I, I see even his his danger as more of a weighted thing, as um, a political thing. So it's it's interesting. I don't have a straight answer on that, but there's definitely misogyny involved. But do you think there's also a, a difference in focus? So take mm. PewDiePie, who um, developed a huge following through essentially live streaming and gaming and was very personable. He was kind of like someone's big brother who was explosive and emotive and funny um made you feel like you were hanging out with someone who was like that little bit older talking about things mum wouldn't want to hear about and there was a real emphasis on community building so his followers called themselves like a bro army Mm. um when he was in that conflict with I think an Indian Bollywood YouTube channel and they were about to you know overtake him in terms of following it had real life consequences you saw graffiti popping up of like subscribe to PewDiePie the Christchurch killer either seriously or ironically people don't know on his live stream as he you know was about to undertake this dreadful massacre says subscribe to PewDiePie so maybe it's not just misogyny that you Mm. you think it's more dangerous it's had these more dangerous real life consequences but a key difference being like you know Hassan Piker who politically obviously I agree with a lot more puts his emphasis less on you know I've got a tooth whitener to sell you and more I've got a social circle to sell you Mm. I mean that's also the thing when we I would say that when we speak about because there are women doing the exact same thing and also you know uh women gay men whoever whoever want to speak up we're talking about this idea that you know straight cis men are awarded more um weight to their words and their content um they are doing the same thing and they've built communities just the same way i keep saying his name wrong but pewdiepie pewdiepie you know felix i like you saying it let's call him felix (laughs) um i think his name's felix isn't it Mm. fool fool the git um (laughs) the way he has and it's like but you know he's had real world consequences perhaps because he does you know maybe perhaps because of his status and gender he does invoke or provoke that more weighted response because people just taking that a little bit more seriously whereas you know there's plenty of non-straight non-cis individuals who both men who both women who are non-binary who are doing what we'd call political influencing but we tend to criticize them a lot more perhaps than you know him or they they are subject to a lot more scrutiny than he was until those things started happening and even now he's sort of like above that he's too big to fail as it were so you know even while I dish out these critiques and even while I you know I'm keen to sort of scrutiny what we call activist influencers for example um I would also remember that you know there's some people who do escape that notice and why is that like question why they do manage to get out from this sort of harsh spotlight on social media and why they may not be as subject to that rigorous questioning of their ethics and their motivations as others are. I mean, I think it's because one, you're right. You know, if you're a woman and you have a huge following, it must be because you've done something which is in some way undignified. Um, so you've sold out or it's just about looks or it's frivolous and so on and so forth. So I think there is that element of misogyny. Um, but I also think that there is a particular frothiness to some of these politics, particularly in the kind of Mm. activist influencer world. And the frothiness for me comes from the way in which political speech is always through the medium of self-help. So when you look at the kind of political posts there are, it's very rarely something like, I don't know, about child poverty or unionizing your workplace. It's very much about, you know, dump him sis as political praxis. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I agree to an extent because I would say that those there is actually the what we'd call that political activism of join a union and, you know, um, child poverty those do exist but they're not going to be the biggest influencers and the biggest profiles we're seeing what i'd call the tip of the iceberg activist influencers because to broaden your message to such a degree that they appeal to so many people it has to be about the self because no one's not everyone's going to buy into it if it becomes you have people out there who are doing sort of 
work that is very specific on community activism that is very specific around um you know these these issues like child poverty um but it's not going to appeal to enough people to elevate them to a position where they're seen outside of the bubble that they exist in whereas the influencers who've or the activist influencers who've gone absolutely stratostrophic, who've got the book deals, who've got the podcasts, who've on all the panels, you know, might even have been on Newsnight. Um, they're the ones who've managed to broaden an appeal to such a wide audience that the message has to be diluted. It just has to, because, you know, to appeal to that swathe of people, it's probably got to go down a bit. Either that or they get more hate followers. But on pl- platforms like Instagram in particular, it's usually fans at first, mm. at least until the backlash happens. So... I would say the reason it's about the self with the influences that we're referring to and the sort of very specific is because they had to turn it onto something that when they talk to people, people go, yeah, yeah, that's me. I can help myself. Like this is a proactive self-help thing. Self-help sells a lot more than saying, you know what? Actually, it's a bit fucked and there's not much we can do right now. Uh, But, you know, if you actually, you can donate a bit and join this community organization, but it is a bit fucked right now. That's not going to cut through as much as being like, you can achieve your dreams and become this better person and, you know, be this political agent of change if you just do these three self-help things and, you know, make your journal and do your grounding and all of that. That's going to that's gonna go far because people want to buy into it. Again, it's that escapism. I mean, one of the things that I found really fascinating about this kind of activist influencer land is the way in which the political thinkers and activists of the past are kind of flattened and presented as influencers themselves. Mm. So everybody quotes the Audrey Lord stuff around self-care as a justification for buying more scented candles. You know, I've seen someone else talking about Olive Morris while also doing a kind of promotion for Uber. <laughs> you know, there is this cognitive dissonance between, you know, the content and the form of the politics here do you think that there's uh, I don't know there's something about the form of social media which encourages us to think that social media is all there is and all there have ever has been in oh, communicating 100%. politics a hundred percent uh there's several there's several like aspects of this one when you're on social media, because social media is this very addictive, small little bubble, you know, I think there is a thing in our brains which says this is all there is. So we don't have to log off and actually do something else because that's almost like that form of cushioning against the addictions we have to social media that makes it impossible to log off um, and makes us not want to. It's like I say to myself, yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, there's that hilarious tweet where it's like uh, they've tweeted about they've said don't do this and they've gone right that's enough activism for the day. That, that's kind of <laughs> it's that it's that it's idea. It's like I think we're quite aware that social media activism as we call it is can be really really powerful don't get me wrong it can be very powerful but there are limits to it there are definite limits to it and you know the time served offline that could be useful is perhaps something that we either can't bring ourselves to do maybe we don't have the confidence to do maybe we just don't want to so we tell ourselves social media is all there is because it it's an excuse almost to stay mm. logged on and i think you know citing the names of former activists these people that's not that's not that new in that for as long as we've had motivational quote books you know you've had the you've had people citing nelson mandela and mahatma gandhi in order to just i don't know go out for a run um like yeah this is this is a really powerful message and they've been right you know writing in their diaries um that's not new it's just the the sort of juxtaposition of citing likes of olive morris while doing Sponcon for Uber, it's that, I think it's that sort of like grasp at legitimacy. Mm. It's on one level, on some level, it's like, you know, perhaps these things are uneasy bedfellows. Like it doesn't matter your intentions. This capitalist system is such that if it's commodified, the sort of like your, the the power of your activism is ultimately serving this capitalist system. You know, you, you might be like, well, but it's bringing awareness, it's doing this. Yeah, great. But structurally, it's part of capitalism. You're continuing that. I mean, and is it is it a sin of ignorance or is it a sin of cynicism? Well, this is a, uh, this is a thing. I think it can be both. It's also it's like a big pit of denial as well, mm. because you know you. I've talked to lots of people who do what is branded activism and influencing online, and that lots of them are very nice people who mean extremely well, and. I think what's happened is a lot of them also have had conversations where they're like, well, I didn't actually ask to be called an activist influencer. I was Mm. branded that by the media, which needs to pigeonhole and commodify as well in order to like, you know, get because of the models of media, which 
are more and more resembling the models of influencing and social media as well because of you know the, where they see the money and everything has to be sold and advertising space etc you need clicks so you have to say oh this person's the brand new activist who's queering i don't know vodka great <laughs> like it's that's it's that selling thing everything has to be a radical sort of um proposition is paired in order to sell a product or a person or like a, a concept even um so but yeah but there's like citing the forebears of people who we saw as doing traditional activism is a way to bring those strands together and be like well this is still you know this is a new form of activism because um and it's actually really radical in its own way because securing the bag is a very radical concept and as an individual if i'm getting this money that's actually really radical especially if i'm from a marginalized identity mm. and it's, it's i think it's just a form of denial sadly I, mean, I think like i'd love to tell myself that being you know i mean well and that i'm if i'm being paid to do something then it's oh um you know great i've i've got some money but i'm still doing this work and i've raised awareness but it's not I mean, it's still I, th- I think like one of the things that I've learned in the last few years because of influence activism mm. is that everything can be co-opted. There's nothing pure. Like I am just waiting for someone to start doing spawn con about like decolonizing BAE systems. Like I think it's on the cards. It's happening. Um, it's going to happen. I think it's probably already happened. To be honest. I was, probably. Um, but what I think is interesting for me is how amenable what you'd broadly call identity politics mm. has been to this kind of commodification of political activism and maybe it's because it's harder to do with socialism maybe you know when you're saying hey we want to expropriate your wealth it's harder to get you know a sponcon deal from uber but that it seems to orbit and coalesce around marginal identities whether it's a marginal identity as a woman as a person of color as you know part of the lgbt community why is it that Idpol has found so strong a home in influencer land. Well, I think there's two reasons for this. One, Idpol is about the individual. So Mm. it's all about the individual labels you have, you know, rather than being like an, it's not intersectional. Identity politics makes you think it's intersectional because it's like, yes, I'm, I'm black and I'm queer and, you know, I've got all these different labels and it's, but it's not actually, it's about sticking different labels on top of each other and then ranking in a hierarchy of how oppressed you think someone is. And it doesn't take into account, you know, any class positions going to different countries where the structure's different and you might be a Westerner in like the global South. It doesn't take in fluctuations. It doesn't take in like financial capabilities i see people who have great financial capital being like well because of x y and z i'm more oppressed than this person it's like that's not how it works it fluctuates so for one it's about the individual so of course identity politics can take a route it's the it's individual sort of like fixed ideas of oppression masquerading as a radical understanding of how to tackle racism and two it's taken root because we think if we throw money at things it solves the problem Mm. so when you have someone who's like a you know has is a marginalized identity and you know the brands are like you know what i know how to solve this (laughs) i'm going to give them five grand to promote this product and that's like an individual piece of reparations. Fantastic. Wow. We've solved we've solved racism. Meanwhile, um, the garment workers in Leicester yeah. are just like, please, the minimum wage. Please. It is this is the thing. It's like because it social media by its nature, the way we build idols on social media is about individuality. It's about individualism. I don't think individuality is a word, but if it is, I've just made it up. Um it's <laughs> individuality about individual- is a word. Individuality is a word. <laughs> great, great. Um yes, I edit for a living. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah so it's about it's about individuality and so so the way it builds idols is it can only be one person because you know the nature like a page you can they have you have pages for collectives or whatever but it really is about looking at one person's profile one person's sort of like the way they talk about politics the way they promote themselves it's about building up a single person a single on a single platform it's not got the room to do collective organizing in the way that activism as we know on the outside does um and it's 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 that makes it so much easier to monetize one person and also single someone out. And individuals, although there's been a lot of very charismatic individuals who've led movements, individuals are not sort of like the success of movements and they're not, because individuals can be bored. And when you have a godlike figurehead, they're always going to, you know, I think power corrupts. Um, So going back to the original question, yeah, the identity politics things have taken root because we throw money at marginalized people who are marginalized because most in part of capitalism um because we think that will solve the problem it's a classic like reform 
um, instead of, you know, mm. defund and burn down the entire system. Um, and also because um, individualism and identity politics is at its heart about individualism and that's what social media thrives on. I mean, I think there's also perhaps a positive spin on it as well, because I remember being in left-wing feminist spaces 10 years ago, and whenever you wanted to talk about the issue of race, it was like you had, you know, identified yourself as a suicide bomber. The hostility that you would get was unreal. I remember trying to have in an organizing space a meeting just for people of color, and white people refused to leave. I had one American woman saying, because she's an international student, that's the same as being, you know, a person of color. Um, you know, I had real hostile interactions. Mm. And now, 10 years on, you've got this audience of like very socially conscious, not necessarily politically active, but socially conscious white people who through Black Lives Matter and through Me Too and through these movements which have been mediated through social media um, come to an understanding of the ways in which they themselves uphold an unequal society and they want to do something about it. And then when you've got you know, kind of pop feminists saying Venmo me and I will absolve you of your sins. Um, that's an easy way to do it, but it's coming out of something which is good, which is the politicization of a generation of people who even a very short time ago were not receptive to these kinds of ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely a step forward. I would never say that, this is the thing, I would never say that influencing, especially when we talk specifically about political influencing and activist influencing, is a wholly bad thing. Because I think awareness does a lot. I think starting those conversations does a lot. But I also think it's fascinating, the systems that we're working with now. Because you know what you just said about the Venmoing, the absolving? It really reminds me of like in the medieval period when the Catholic Church would sort of like get people to what was it pay pay for pay to, to pray their, pay for pardons pay to pray and pay for pardons so mm. they'd pay sort of priests or um the pardoner for a pardon you know it's in Chaucer or whatever and they pay for these pardons these bits of paper and every time they sin they just get a new pardon and it's literally that same system which is so funny um <laughs> wow wow capitalism really just wow it's um, like capitalism just reinvented <laughs> feudalism i mean this is this is Joseph Dean's theory which is that what well, capitalism says that it's reinvented feudalism oh yeah you know with you know, huge corporations take on the role of kings, all of us are tenants, um, but also perhaps with the uh, relationship of guilt and absolution. Absolutely. It's that, it's that guilt and absolution relationship. And that, I mean, again, I want to stress, I think that this politicization of a young generation, particularly those who may have been in positions of, you know, broad privilege, although it fluctuates depending on, you know, your status or where you are, whatever. Um, it's That's a good thing. It's a really good thing. What I am concerned about is how s sort of like situating it solely on sites that you find on social media, like, you know, Instagram spaces, comment sections, Twitter discourse, will not give those people the chance to develop and grow beyond that because all they're mm. getting is constantly one person saying something, a backlash against that person happens. So they all run to the other person and go, oh no, I've, I've done something wrong. I need to pay you some money. Um, and then, then that turns out, actually, you know what? There's an opposing view to this and it's coming from another black person. <gasps> so who do we believe? Um, so there's this real conflict for people who, because they're just running to individual figures rather than reading around the subject. I'm not suggesting you need to be reading like fucking Marx all the time to be versed in... I'm, I'm suggesting that. Yeah. Just to be very clear. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but I mean, there's that because I think a lot of a lot of the arguments I see, are especially around what we're talking about, which is activist influencing, specifically in the feminist sphere, is that there's no accessible text. There's plenty of accessible text. Read Revolting Prostitutes. That is so accessible. Mm. That's such a great book. Um, there's a lot of accessible, like bell hooks. They are accessible. They might sound like these lofty titles, but there really are these accessible texts out there. And I think once you get that awareness and that politicization, you have to broaden out your sphere because otherwise you're just taking the word of different false idols. And that's the problem. It's like someone coming to me and saying, can you tell me everything about feminism? And I will tell them what I know and what I believe to be true. But is that correct? Is that a broad view? No, it's just from my own like potted together experiences and my personal opinions. You have to kind of like develop your critical thinking skills. And I think social media develops sheep, not critical thinking skills. But I mean, I think that maybe this has an emergence in a problem with the politics itself, you know, we've got this kind of, 
you know, lived experience is the kind of absolute defense and, you know, kind of Mm. stamp of legitimacy and authority. And sometimes it is useful because you can say, I have lived it. This is what I've seen. It's like a credible witness giving testimony. But it's also turned into as a, in my case, you know, a Muslim Bengali woman. It means I am always correct in my assessment of the social reality that I live in to me then seems more dangerous. And then you have conflicting lived Mm. experiences. Um, You know, I remember being in a conversation with David Baddiel where he was talking about his lived experience as a Jewish man and on the left, anti-Semitism being treated less seriously and it would never happen to anyone else. And I was like, well, hang on, my lived experience as a Muslim tells me something different. And you add this irreducible impasse between kind of hermetically sealed Mm. subjective prisons and then it means that you have the space opened up for someone to say I'm going to commodify my lived experience because that's what that's what influencing is and And therefore I'm going to be a political arbitrator of really quite complicated and contested ideas and issues yeah I mean I'm I'm a long time now, I say long time, it's probably been the last couple of years when it's been on the rise, a uh, real a, a real opponent of identity politics as we know them today, because I think identity politics, as w- they were brought around in order to make things more intersectional and make us understand how someone's lived experience could influence the way they saw the world and could influence the testimony they could bring to the table. But, you know, if you rely solely on what we call lived experience, as you say, you get completely conflicting sort of um, accounts, testimonies, political views. Like if I went to Modi and said, Modi, what's your lived experience about, you know, why is Hindu nationalism like good? He'd give me a great long answer. Modi, talk to me as part of the BIPOC community. Yeah, he'd be like, (laughs) Modi would be like, wow, my lived experience as a man of colour. And it's like, well, no, you're still a fascist. I'm not going to like believe what you say. So lived experience is really limiting. And the problem is with social media Again, it's the sort of like setup of it as well. It's a platform where someone who has a lot of power can say something and then they control both the way someone replies to it, the discourse that happens. It is a space for them to air their views, of course, but you're just going to get what they say. And only if you only see you that one side of it, it's just a, like the soul, their, their testimony only. And it really sort of skews you because then suddenly you start going down this whole way. You're like, but that person says something different and that person says something different. And then you have to think, hmm, maybe it's structural. Maybe I could look at the st- sort of structure of the individual here. And But influencing relies on the individual. Again, like going back to this point, it relies on individualism. That's how it sells itself. That's how it commodifies. And, you know, from any sort of perspective, if I turn... we A lot of the things I think we do nowadays on social media particularly is turn the interpersonal into the structural. So we mm. say that, like, you know, we have a... Your, some, for example a cancellation of someone there'll be perhaps a cancellation of someone who I wouldn't call a celebrity maybe like they are an influencer and a lot of people maybe just didn't like them and they'll come up with these views being like well actually you know what they said this thing which makes them you know against this marginalised person and all of that mm. and it's like we love to do that a lot and we do that the other way as well and where we turn the personal into the structural by saying you know perhaps oh well because I have this lived experience um, as I said before it's really radical of me to ask for the money to do this x y and z and that is actually anti-capitalist even if you think it's not because i'm actually subverting the capitalist system to work for me and then you, you just have to like it's also as if there have been no black or brown capitalists ever yeah, like I know. who do you think like is running the mines I of know. like aluminium in the middle of india man it's really <laughs> it's really annoying for several reasons but also because i think identity politics insists that we see anyone who is of a marginalized identity particularly people of color as sort of magic fucking angels and it's like (laughs) you're slightly brown so everything you say is correct and you're right on everything and i'm going to defer to you and it's like okay you know what when we're talking about say racism or whatever those voices should be taking precedence but there are lots of you know you've got kemi badenoch in government saying white privilege doesn't exist is that a voice you want to elevate really over, over a white person who says that perhaps, you know, white privilege is real and exists. So it's not a, there's not like a subjective, no, there's not a like one size fits all answer to this. And we can't just keep going around saying like, I'm going to listen to this person because they're X, Y, and Z minority. And, you know, that me and their lived experience means that they, you know, they're mad because lived experience makes us do, you know, wild things. There's, yeah, my lived experience is being a hot mess. Yeah. Like, 
I, there's this, you know, there's things I could point to in my past where I've got lived experience. It's made me a cunt. So I don't know if I can say that or not, but like, <laughs> yeah, you can <laughs> made me a total cunt. And it's like, okay, you might have lived experience and we should take that in, but you need to approach these discussions with nuance and understanding and have the range before you actually try and like say, well, it's X, Y, and Z, this and that. And that means this. Like, I think a lot of the time we throw around so many it's also big words. We make a lot of these discussions actually inaccessible by being like, well, you know, this is a marginalized agenda with an ideological mm. perspective. It's like, well, you're just saying that to like obscure what's actually going on. And then you strip it all back and you think, hmm, is this person working as an agent of capitalism in their own self interest? Okay, yeah, maybe they are. And good for them on that level. But don't pretend it's anything bigger than that. I mean, so do you think that? there's going to be room to grow from where we are. Because where we are is in this kind of cul-de-sac of, you know, lived experience dance-offs. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? And and you don't get any closer to, you know, what is our shared social reality and how do we negotiate that and how do we build a movement? But you have this kind of quite, you know, it's like an oil well of potential, of, mm. you know, potential politicization and, you know, that awareness, you know, building towards an increased dissatisfaction with the way power is organized and distributed you know is there a way for social media to play a role in navigating us out of the cul-de-sac and tapping into that well of potential well I mean I think there is I think there is but again I could just be you know catch me in five years when I'm shelling uh, goods for Mastercard, and we'll talk again. <laughs> um, no, I, when you're doing the decolonized BA, I'm doing systems. my decolon. You know, that's a really good idea. Yeah, and listen, you're going to be like how to, <laughs> how to make drones intersectional. How to, yeah, how to make drones intersectional. Um, make sure the AI actually recognizes black and brown faces brown too. Faces. We that is that's a, quali- that's a quality. That's a quality. Um, civilian wedding. <laughs> so, I think I think the thing is like. Social media is, a. there are people, I, having slagged off this like sphere of influencing for the last 20 minutes, I do want to say there are people out there doing really good, useful stuff with their platform. And, you know, you've got like young people like Hassan Patel, who's running massive campaigns mm-hmm. from his his platform. And he's he's mobilizing loads of people from just like an Instagram account, and a Twitter account. And um, it's just about, I th- and I think there are also people out there who are really looking at this with the same like side eye that we are like we're we're not the first and we're not the last to be going like "Mm, this is a bit not going as well is it there's a lot of people on like the left um who really are looking at these systems and being like this isn't making me happy being part of this and i think there are better ways to and more productive ways to actually go about sort of the politicization and capitalize on the sort of political awakening of this like young generation through social media there's lots of people out there who really you know they, they've looked at the sort of ongoing discourse that happens again and again and again about, oh, this influence is bad, this influence is bad, and thinks, hmm, this seems to be a lot of focus on individuals and not so much focus on sort of where the movement can go beyond them. And they are having these discussions in, you know, and I've heard them, like they are in rooms on Clubhouse, they're having these chats and they're in these small groups and they're organising and there's people who do community organising outside of social media spaces who are coming on here and being like well you know let's let's convert the people who want to go to who want to come to this like clubhouse room or come to this online discussion into people who now attend Mm -hmm. a meeting down the road so you know those these spaces are proving a way to link up with fellow-minded people they're proving a way to organize and mobilize i don't want to like i'll cite momentum here even though i know the <laughs> the name is the name is dragged through the mud quite a lot but we saw in like 2017 mm. them using things like social media to really mobilize these young people so it's not like there's not patterns and not like there's not roadmaps for that to happen it's just i think the thing is with the influencers because they do straddle the line especially political influencers you straddle the line of celebrity culture and politics, it's impossible to look away from for a lot of people because it's that, you know, it's it really hits the heart of what gets people going, which is that sort of like gossipy celebrity culture mixed with like politics that is life or death. And like these really big discussions, the problem is the platforms they're happening on are not quite equipped to continue those discussions in a nuanced way. 280 characters in a comment section on Instagram are not enough to have proper discussions about the limits of identity politics um, because it just leads with, people being entrenched in the positions they're entrenched with and not actually listening to anyone else I actually do think Clubhouse has been quite a good place for that but Mm. that is also turning into a space that is just constantly 
people not having the range to talk about these things and the people who want to speak loudest are the people who don't actually know much about it, um, which is true on all social media because the loudest voices are usually the ones, and I say that booming into the mic, the loudest, <laughs> the loudest voices are usually the ones who have the, who are the most ignorant or perhaps think they know the most without really having taken stock of all sides of a situation. So, yeah, it's it's... I, I just always I just plead nuance and I think I think there's like a lot of it is an oil well but I would I do think it's I do think we should note that there are people who are out there who are already in the oil well and people them like young people themselves are like this is not a discussion that is serving me and I do want to sort of get out of it so the reason we might not see them as much is because they're not the ones in the comment sections but they are mm. organizing outside of that so I don't want to raise their existence well, I mean, I, I suppose there are defenders of influencer culture and social media politics culture who would say this is a corrective to gatekeeping, that kind of very intensely hierarchical in-group, out-group um, policing, which defined early iterations of social movements. And I think maybe what I found myself thinking is that I don't think that this has been an end to gatekeeping at all. What it has done is use anti-intellectualism as a pretext for gatekeeping so it's saying in order to make people feel better you don't have to have done the reading your lived experience is enough well your lived experience is, is a hugely powerful starting point but actually sometimes it does matter if you're right or wrong I would really say it depends on the community we're talking about because I do know there are like social media communities out there of people who you know their voices may not have been heard before and this has this has, I would say this has in some ways, you know, social media rise has undone that gatekeeping in some senses. Like you have a much wider range. And I think I would say social media has definitely introduced me to figures and identities that I need to listen to and brought about mm. a political consciousness or maybe a more considered political consciousness than I would have had without it. So I would say in some senses there is that, you know, the gatekeeping has been broken down. But because social media is so vast, the other side is also true. This is the thing. There's no like one size fits all answer to this, sadly. But, um, in that the gatekeeping is still going on, but it's sort of like just the colour of the gatekeepers has changed. <laughs> so it's not just all white people. There's now some brown and black faces in there too. Um, but what their gatekeeping Pretty is... Pretty Patel somewhere smiling yeah, to herself. Smiling. We love representation whiskey. politics. Um, so that gatekeeping, yeah, the, there is an anti... I do think there is what you refer to as an anti-intellectualist movement that has sort of taken up as a defense on social media and like you know I saw a lot of I see a lot of defending where it's along the lines of um oh you shouldn't have to read x y and z because and it goes back to the accessible text thing it's like well mm. you know these Instagram captions are accessible and yeah they are they're like a early learning center book great um and they probably have really turned some people onto you know concepts they wouldn't have come across before or they've helped boil them down they've helped me boil some things down sometimes everything's like oh yeah that's what it means okay cool mm. um but hopefully that would spark a curiosity to go further i think the problem with social media is instead of sparking that curiosity to buy well i say buy haha <laughs> capitalism instead of sparking that curiosity to go to your local library and borrow <laughs> um, and borrow a book that sort of takes you takes a concept further you think i want to find out more about this ideology i want to find more about this concept i want to find out more about this you know political movement and what was it the umbrella movement am i doing that the umbrella movement in the 70s i think it was like those kind of things those counter mm -hmm. counter revolutionary things um those movements the problem with social media is you just keep scrolling so when I'm finding something out, I'm like, oh yeah, I should I should really look that up later. And then I think, then I forget it in two minutes because I've moved on to the next post or I've moved yeah, on to the yeah, next yeah. tweet. So it's because it, we consume things so fast. It's like sometimes I'll read a social media post and I'll be like, I want to hold on to that post because it really is, it has made me think about things in a different way. And I, I just can't, like, it's just my concentration loses it. Like, even if I save it, that mm. feeling that I'm trying to think about, that feeling of learning to sit with something and process it, is just not aided by social media. That's the problem. It's like, it wants you to keep consuming. You have to keep consuming. And so the patterns in built in your head because, you know, social media has, I don't want to say changed, and I'm sure scientists or neuroscientists will be like, shut up, it hasn't changed our brain. But it has like rewired some of our attention spans. Um, the way that that's worked means that, you know, we're compelled to keep scrolling instead of sitting with the information, taking it in and thinking, 
Hmm. And that's again comes back to the idea of like the reactiveness, the mm. fact we can't hold these nuanced discussions because it has to be a knee jerk, instant opinion that we form, an instant mastery of the mm. subject where we've only just started learning. It's it's that like Canning Duggan, con- I can't remember the name, the crude, the thing where you think you're really good at something, you know everything about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know the phrase you're talking about, mm. and in my head, I just can't reach it. So it has just turned into the Diane Kruger yeah. effect which yeah. I know isn't right. Well it's the Diane Kruger effect that's what we're going to call it. <laughs> it's, the, you know, it's the, the Diane Kruger the, effect. It's, it's the Diane Kruger effect darling. <laughs> it's, it's the I, the syllables are similar. Yeah they're very it's like the Dunning I, I want to call it the Diane Kruger effect I think in fact yeah, that I should be. Yeah I think we be, should all just call it the Diane Kruger there effect. There we go we've done, we've, um, done we've, we've influenced everyone um, but yeah well, it's that Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been just such an enjoyable discussion and you've approached the issues with a level of both seriousness and lightness of touch, which is exactly what I love to see in these interviews. Um, if people want to find more of your work, where should they go? If they want to be influenced by me, uh, by <laughs> they can follow me on Twitter. It is so ironic that I'm promoting this at the end of this, but um, they can follow me on Twitter <laughs> at M. Lothian McLean all one word um for thought shots head to instagram that's at moya underscore lm um but if you want to just read my work without any of the faff then go to my website which is moylo the mclean all one word dot co dot uk um but yeah don't i'm not a prophet i'm just i'm just as as a just someone as one famous influencer sometimes. likes to say i'm just a baby girl <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just a baby girl <laughs> i'm just a baby girl um thank you so much for having you me ash so much